Thanks, Annie. Okay, so, so yeah, I'm uh, Daniel Fullerton, and I work for Utiba slash Amdocs, which is Amdocs's mobile financial services division. Um, and I wasn't fortunate enough to start with a blank slate. Um, basically, someone came up to me one week and said, we've built this thing, but we're not sure if it's ready to go to production. And on Monday, uh, instead of you know, going through like Rob did, a, a nice set of goals and stuff, I think someone must have done a presentation on Spring Boot, and I thought, that sounds pretty cool. And so I ported this thing from what was a, basically just a Weld application. So they, they pulled Weld in for a DI. Uh, we had Eclipse Link there. And I say we have zero tests, but we had, a, like, we had a couple of integration tests. But we didn't have any unit testing. We didn't have any test coverage. So we didn't really want this thing going into production. Um, and so what Spring Boot provided me was a good way that, to hold everything together, a very easy way to start. And, and I, I could see a lot of parallels between the advantages in DropWizard. And you've got your single jar. You've got your sort of convention over configuration type stuff. And that's, that's what really drew me to Spring Boot. And I should point out that it wasn't a REST API or anything, which is another reason that Drop Wizard probably wouldn't have fitted perfectly there. So yeah, so, so, so these are just a few things that, that I like the most. One thing is, is that single jar just makes deployment so easy. Um, our legacy systems are very complicated, and we always seem to have problems with people deploying the wrong versions. With this, it's done very nicely. You, you really need to worry about it. And the convention over configuration means that a lot of the things just kind of work out of the box. And at the same time, it's, it's, not, it's not all just magic. It's, it's pretty clear when you look at the source code what exactly is going on. And finally, and this gets back to the tests, was a lot of our our testing, you see these integration tests, we weren't really sure if they were testing all of the business logic. So by the end of the project, we had sort of, you know, 80% unit test coverage, and it's made building on top of this thing so much easier. Oh. I see, you see, yeah, you stole my slogan. So yeah, um, this, this is Google presentation, which I don't know why it's coming off, but yeah. My problem wasn't only make jar not war, it was ears, SARS, and RAS. So we'd built a few projects in Java EE, and I never really enjoyed it. It was never a great deal of fun, because all of these things seemed to just stand in the way of me actually writing the code that did what people wanted. And so this, this kind of, this gets past that, and, and basically it makes coding a little bit more fun. These three people as well. So Phil Webb and David Sire are, are kind of like the, the core team of Spring Boot. And normally with open source projects, they can be a bit detached, especially like I think, I think they're both based out of London or, or somewhere, so anyway, far away from Australia. But both these guys have been really helpful. Uh, David Sire especially is often on the, the Gitter uh, which is kind of like a chat room for, for GitHub. And he, he's really understanding of other people's stupidity. So many questions I see. You know, you can just imagine him sitting there in London thinking, God, what the hell are they doing? <laughs> um, but, but, you know, he's always there to respond. And, and these two guys are very active in GitHub. So if you find bugs, you know, you, you push pull requests, they do get handled fairly quickly. And uh, Josh Long, well, Starbucks man, as he seems to like to be called, is the evangelist for Spring. And if you want to see sort of a, a quicker, a nice real overview of, I think, building a, an application from start to finish, uh, check out his VJUG session or just, just Google him on YouTube. And, and there's quite a good video of that. Finally, uh, and I'll, I'll just clear that for the time being. So there's, there's two things that, now this came up after, um, after I'd actually started the project. But this is the spring initializer uh, with no E. And, and I've, 
I've come to think of this as kind of like Subway for Java development. Because you know, you, you come through and you select your, uh, you select your build system. Of course, you always go with Gradle, uh, unless you're some kind of you know, XML lover. Um, you, can, you can select the version. So uh, 1.3.0 milestone one is out now. Uh, it's what I'll use in the demo. I believe it's supposed to come out around uh, spring's conference time into September. Um, and yeah, so, so basically from here, you know, you choose what you want, you know. Do you want a web server? Do you want inter integrations with some of the spring things? All of the spring things, as you'd expect, are built in really well. And they just, they just kind of work. So you don't have to worry about them a great deal because they've all got auto configurations. So it basically just detects them and sets them up. Um, here we've got JDBC and JPA. JPA is Hibernate by default. <coughs> Um, you can use uh, ClipsLink, it does work. I, I used the ClipsLink quite happily and aside from the fact that I had to manually set up the, the data source, which probably is more of me being a, a bit of a spring newbie rather than anything, um, yeah, it, it, it does just work. And of course, you, know, you can select databases and stuff, but ultimately it, it's really just building that build script. So. Before I show you an example, there's, there's one other thing, which is the reference guide. Um, so the reference guide is, is really good, and it's, it's, it's kind of like simple. I wanted to use another word there, but I thought probably not good. So you can go here, and it, and it goes through all these different features, and it's, it's just kind of really straight to the point. So you can get into that, you know, bringing in that new feature sort of as soon as possible. Okay, so here I have my first project. My first project actually came from Spring Initializer. So basically I just selected a few things, downloaded it, unzipped it, and imported it into IntelliJ. Now I believe IntelliJ does have support to automatically pull it from the initializer, but I didn't use that, so we'll ignore it. And so this, this is my, my build.gradle to begin with. Now, I'm not great with Gradle. I, pardon? But, but fortunately I had, yeah, I had great help. Um, <laughs> which was the reference documentation. He was useless. <laughs> um, but it, it, it's, a, it's a good point to mention that this, this is all done in Gradle, but you know, we went to production with Maven and it's, it's all pretty much the same. The big difference is for Gradle to manage some of the dependencies, they wrote their own plugin. Um, and the reason they wrote that plugin was for exclusion. So in Maven, you often do things like um, you want to take, say, the web thing, but you don't want Tomcat. And so you can just exclude Tomcat and bring in what you want. Um, it's a little bit different in Gradle. So in, in Gradle, I think it, the plugin kind of takes care of it for you, which I'm a little bit cautious about because I like to understand exactly what's going on. Um, and I must admit, with Gradle, sometimes I'm a bit cautious. But otherwise, it's awesome. And I would never say a bad word against it. I've got these two bottles right next to So you can see, like, it, it's, it's pretty basic. So I think they've got the Eclipse plugin there for just the sake of it. But the Spring Boot plugin there. Um, and my dependencies here are pretty basic. So. I bought in JPA, I bought in JDBC, and I wanted to use H2. And finally, I just started with, um, I, I brought in the test uh, dependency as well. It does help you with the basic testing. Uh, I won't really go into that here. And so, so this, is, this is unchanged from what I got from the initializer. Now, th this, is, this is what comes out, you know, you start with your little main method there. Sorry, yeah, I... Presentation mode time. Yeah, much better. I don't know how to get out of it, so we'll wait for that later. <laughs> so yeah, so, so this, is, this is the Spring Boot application. Now, this bit's actually changed a little bit since I started using it, and they brought in this Spring Boot annotation, and all it really is is a collection of other annotations. And so 
whoop, what, it, what it basically does is, you know, it enables auto configuration, which is basically saying we want to use the, the Spring Boot auto configuration things. I want a component scan, so I don't have to tell it to look at all my little beans. Um, and I want it to be configuration, which I'll, I'll show later. That's why I don't like presentation, though. All right. Um, so, so that's the application itself. Um, and there's, there's really not that much to it. There's an empty properties file here that you can put <coughs> config in. Uh, and there's a really basic test that you don't really need to see it. But it does do something very helpful, even if you're not currently writing tests like I am. Because if you stuff anything up in terms of basically anything that will stop it from starting, you know really quickly. Because that test will fail as it tries to start up the demo application. Now, you can run it straight from the IDE, and you can debug it straight from the IDE. So, should be pointed out, I don't have a good Mac, so it may be a little slow. And it's died twice today, so I'm really hoping it pulls on through. So yeah, you, you get your beautiful banner. Um, <laughs> and, and you know, we, we start up, we, we load Hibernate, and. And so it doesn't really do much. And because it doesn't have a web server, it basically just exits. Um, now, if you're like me and you've got time to do these kind of things, you know, you want to spruce up your app a little bit. So, you can customize that little banner to begin with. Uh, th this is actually one of the 1.3 features, which is ANSI banners. Um, now, that, that'll do wonders when you're selling this to the business. Um, believe me, I think the most exciting thing was that when I first booted this up was the logo. When they see the color one, they're going to be, yeah, just <laughs> knock them out. Can, can you recommend some um, ASCII art websites? No, because it is so hard to find them. I, I did want the ANSI Duke logo, but I, yeah. Turn, turns out that takes a lot longer than I expected. Um, okay, so the, the other thing is to show the, the, the big jar. Um, so I'm using Gradle here, so. So I built it through Gradle, uh, ma mainly to make sure that it actually is there. Right, so, so that's all good. Uh, that, that outputs from the test. And so if we go into the build directory, now it's got the original on the right, which is before they repackage it. Yeah, I'll make it bigger. Apple Plus, Apple Plus here? Apple. Yeah. All right, so it's, it's big now. Um, and if we look inside that, so you'll see that it contains a few spring things for bootstrapping it. And then as you scroll up, it's got all your dependencies there. And in fact, your, your code really just you know, is, is that tiny little bit. And your, your banner, of course. Um, now, that, that comes out as 19 meg for sort of basically very little plus H2 uh, database access and stuff like that. Um, so we'll go to the next example because that, that, that does a little bit more. That, that shows how you can, you can start doing things with sort of very, very little and, and very little ramp up time, which is what I was after. Right, so I've, I've created a bit of a model here because um, I wanted to make sure that my database actually works. Um, So you know you got, you got your meetup which has an ID and a title and some members, any members who have names. And in here we're just using a lambda to create an initializing bean, and that's basically just used to set some state so that we can basically see some some things as we go. Now, just too small. Uh -huh.
that make it any bigger or just hit the stuff? No, I get lost in presentation, mate. We never find our way around. Okay, so the other thing that I really wanted from this was, and it, it's something that bit us in the past, was configuration. So we rolled our own configuration and it became horrible over time. Um, well, it may have not been horrible at some point, but by the time I got there, it was really horrible. Um, one thing that I, I love about Spring Boot is how simplistic it is to create a, a class that, that encapsulates your configuration. So here I've got a, a demo properties class. I've told it these have a prefix of meldjvm demo and make it a component so that it's scanned by the auto scan. And it, it just has two things in it. It has a, a string greeting and a numeric value. Now, if we want to configure something there, all we really need to do is, is take that uh, prefix and the name of the field and, and stick it in application.property. So, And it, it should be pointed out that um, this, this stuff here is all, all out of the box and the configuration especially is really flexible with what you can do. So if you sort of look through what, what it does, it's, it's, really, it's really easy to add things. So one thing I needed was I needed a map in my config um, and literally I just made a field with a map and it it all automatically got in there. So it's very easy in that regard. Now, just to prove that this does actually work, uh, I, I also made use of the repositories. Um, not coming from a spring world, um, I'd never kind of used this stuff before. So this is sort of a bit like Ruby on Rails type stuff because um, I'm using it really simply as just a JPA repository, but you can do things like you can add methods and it, it automatically fills in the blanks in terms of the queries. Um, like I said, because we were using Eclipse Link, we just basically manually did JDBC queries um, and that got us through and that was really required because ours was some batch processing, so it was a little bit ugly in terms of the JDBC stuff, but I chose this because it's, it's really easy to set up. So if we go back to our demo application uh, and so I, I can just print all of the output of um, of that repository, which is the Meetup repository, to to um to standard error, and. That should work quite nicely. Um, I'll do it from the command line so you can see it. And, and again, you know, you can use the um, you can use the Spring Boot plugins to to execute things. Um, so if I run that, uh, and I'm lucky, uh, it will basically just build it and execute it as normal. Yeah. For some reason, Gradle does that with my logo. No, can't understand that. And so you can see there, it's, it's just printed out basically what, what I loaded into the database. So obviously, you're probably not going to be using H2 in production, but it, it's, it's easy to get from basically nothing to a, a really simple CRUD interface or a, a connection to the database, I should say. Now, most people probably don't want to stop there. Um, our dependency-wise wasn't far from this. We included a few more things for monitoring and stuff like that. Um, most people want to bring in the web and, and you know, HTTP servers, all that fun stuff. Um, and so in demo three, in demo three, I, I changed the Gradle build a little bit to include 
um, the Tomcat starter, and the Time Leaf template stuff. Uh, Time Leaf is kind of what they use out of the box. I'm not a huge fan of it, but it does just work. Uh, I believe they support Groovy templates and a few other ones. Um, it's just, just a basic templating language. I'll, I'll show you one of my templates here um, where I have a list showing all my meetups. Um, so yeah, it, it's just a very basic templating language. Um, and so from there, we can, we can start and, and as, as normal, we can just go to our application again and execute it from there. Now, to, to wire that up, we need a controller. So here I'm just saying, you know, I, wanna, I want this controller to be for slash. I want to, I pull in my meetup repository using DI. And finally, I create a mapping for this list. And by returning model and view with that, it'll look up the list template. And it'll pass in the meetups. Uh, so if we go to demo application, we can run that. Yay. And so you see down here, it'll go through and, and do its little thing and finally start my application. Right. Yes. <laughs> In, yeah, in, in seven seconds, uh, which isn't too bad. Um, so there you go. So, you know, I'm halfway to, you know, my, my website now. Uh, interactivity will come later, but, but at the most time, people just want to see the data, right? Um, now, one of the other awesome features that that I forgot to mention before was, and this, this is coming in 1.3, so it's not in any of the release versions, but 1.3 will carry it in, is the executable jar. Um, so here, I've added in, uh, so, so for the Spring Boot plugin, I want executable to equal true. Now, just terminate that and uh, go back to you. Now, I've built this already, so my jar is there. So it, it's sitting there, and if I vim my jar, which sounds really weird, it will, uh, it will prove me wrong, apparently, and not show me what's on top of it. Um, apparently, I've not rebuilt this since I added it. So the idea behind the executable jar is, is pretty much as it sounds, because I'm in the wrong folder. All right. So it's not hard to start Spring Boot applications. Most people can manage Java minus jar and the jar name. But sometimes, you know, you, um, you don't want to type that much every day, especially if you're starting it regularly. So what they did is they, they included a bash script at the front of the jar. And the bash script basically looks for Java home and finds a JD, uh, Java version and executes it. So if we look at build. So this, this is me vimming my jar. It's, it's really confused, the zip plugin. And you'll see that they, they love their banners. It, it's got a bash script at the front of it. And that's like, that in itself is pretty neat, but it's not that useful. But one really cool thing it does is this thing will also operate as a init script. So if you want to start this as a service, you s just have to symlink this to your etc. init D folder. Um, different people have either found that cool or scary. Um, I find it cool because I don't have to create an init script. And yeah, I, I don't really see the downside. And any, if you do have a downside to it, yeah, tell me later. So, yeah, I can, like, so, and in fact, it builds like that. So if I just go like that. So yeah, it just starts the application. So, you know, think of how many times you type Java minus jar. It's saving you a good few characters every time. 
uh, while we're here, it's, it's good to know some of the things that it includes. So it includes, like, just out of the box, a really basic error handler that just shows a generic error. Um, one of the other neat things here is web jars. So I don't have a demo to show it, but if you want to include a web jar to your application, you basically just include it as a dependency, and it gets pulled up and, and hosted there. So it's, it's really easy to just pull in whatever you want in terms of, of JavaScript libraries. Yeah, does everyone know what web jars are? They're basically just JavaScript libraries or CSS files in jars so you can easily use them. And, and they're all versioned, so you can sort of specify slash web jar slash uh, jQuery slash XXX, and it'll get you that version. Sorry? And pull in more. That sounds terrifying. So and it, and, it, and it just works generally. It works. Oh, nice. Um, so one of the other cool things here is uh, you're not bound to Tomcat. So if for any reason you want Jetty, you know you can just change that, um, and it'll start up. And it won't start up there because it's Gradle. Sorry, Gradle. Not because it's Gradle, because it's IntelliJ. So if I go back and, and build that with uh, boot run this time, so it'll rebuild and it'll, it'll detect that instead of having Tomcat, it's got Jetty, and it will start up a Jetty service. Uh, likewise, for Undertow, basically it all works out of the box, and you don't really have to think about it. So there you go, Jetty server, and again, you know, we're started. Um, now they've included some like config by default, so you don't have to add it. So if I add in uh, server.port equals 8180, that'll just work, and that'll work across different um, web servers. So if I switch from Tomcat to Jetty, it'll always be the same. Now, getting back to what's included in 1.3, so this doesn't work perfectly in terms of um, IntelliJ yet. It actually seems to work a little bit better with Eclipse. But they wanted to lower the time it takes you to, um, to actually reload the application after you've changed templates or things like that. So, if I run, if I add in that, so these are the dev tools. Um, and the dev tools, the dev tools, come on. The dev tools are basically a bunch of configuration properties that they think will be helpful for developers. So in our case, they would do things like they turn off caching in Timeleaf, and they also start up a few background services. Um, this is a little bit sketchy at the moment in terms of how they actually get enabled. So if you start it from Java minus jar and the jar, it will not be included. If you start it from the IDE, it will be included. If you start it from Gradle, it may be included. If you start it from Maven, it doesn't get included. Um, I'm going to assume they're going to tighten that up a little bit because uh, it's a little bit confusing. So I'll just get out of presentation mode for a second here and, and go over to Gradle. And, and I just want to run boot run here. Right, so no, I don't. Nope, sorry, that's a terrible idea. So let me just build it to, to bring in the dependencies. Uh, and I want to do this so I can just execute it with those dev tools. Because once they're enabled, they allow me to basically not have to worry about rebuilding it every time. Okay, so I started up again and and I hope that it picks up my change. It 
hasn't. How do I just refresh one Gradle project? Why, why can I only refresh all of them? Ask IDA. Sure. Damn it. Maybe can you right click just like No, it doesn't, doesn't give me any options. It's, yeah, it's, it's not the end of the world, though. Uh, except, like I said, my, my computer is not great, so naturally it tries to rebuild bloody everything that I have. So the, the idea behind this is it doesn't really reload, but it restarts. So, so if I make a change to a Java file or anything like that, it will restart the whole application and bring in my changes. Um, of course, it takes longest for the one I actually want. This is why you want the new configuration model, but it's free. <laughs> Bad. Okay, so it, it's starting up and, and hopefully including my dev tools now, um, which we'll find out pretty quick. Now, there's, there's two things to note here. It, it's included the dev tools and it's also started a library load server. So who has heard of library load? Yeah, I only found out about it a few weeks ago, really, and it kind of just to me, it doesn't help that much. Like most people can manage to press refresh, um, but you know, if you if you're not one of those people who likes browser buttons, it's got you covered. So if we go over this um, now on port eighty one eighty. Right now, say you're told that you're uh, you're. Your, your web application is just too happy, so you're told to remove all exclamation marks. Now, this is, this is where it kind of falls over in terms of IntelliJ. So in Eclipse, this is kind of more automated in that it will, it will copy those resources into the, the build directory automatically. Here, I'm just going to hit uh, process resources to do it for me manually. Hey? W will it? Yeah, it will also do that, yeah. In this case, I just changed the template so I don't have to recompile everything. Yeah, I, I found compiling it didn't transfer the templates across. Yeah, and, th and that, that's part of what DevTools takes care of. So it's disabled the cache for me. So I don't have to worry about that. And if you saw it here, it went through the, the logo again because it refreshed the application. So if we go over here, our exclamation marks are gone. Um, yeah, th it worked for CSS, but I don't think it worked for the templates. Okay, so, so that's kind of the web stuff. Um, now, Live Reload basically does the same thing, but you, know, you don't have to be at your browser and press that button. I, they charge $10 for the Mac app. I don't really see why people would ask, pay $10 for not pressing a button, but I'm not a web developer. Now, Demo 04 shows some more of the Spring interaction. Um, so I wanted to show how it can pull in a, a Spring library and basically you can use it out of the box and you don't really need to worry about it. Um, so here we have created a uh, demo controller. Now, I mean a meetup controller. So a meetup controller again is just another controller uh, and this time we're providing two methods, so we've got, uh, 
So we're, we're injecting two repositories now so I can fetch the members. And this is basically just a simple REST API. Um, so you, you pass into the meetup call, you give it an ID, and it fetches it from the database. And likewise for the member, it, it'll fetch it from the database. Now, what I wanted to show here is uh, Spring Hadios, which is an acronym for something to do with hyperlinks. Google it. Um, and the way you set it up is kind of neat. So, so here we have uh, our resource, which is our, our meetups, basically a little, a little JSON object that, that goes along with our meetup. Uh, I was a little lazy here and didn't want to create a new class. So there's just a little inner class which basically maps this, this um, JPA bean. And so it's just got the ID of the title. Now, again, if we start that up as normal, now, the only changes we've made here is, you know, I've told it that I want this Hadios thing. And so it basically takes care of the rest. So it'll pull in what I need. Um, and you don't really need to worry about it. And, and because it is a Spring component, and because it, it's not just Spring components, it's basically anything that's really popular, they provide auto configuration. So it kind of just works. All right, so now if I go back here, you know, I can call my meetups and I can fetch them. And I've just got a really simple link to self here. Um, which isn't that useful. But it really highlights how easy it is to add these things. So if I go back to my meetup controller and I want to add another thing to this, uh, say I want to add a link to all of my members. So I can get my attendees and then I can pass the for each one of these nice little lambda things. And then again, it, it's, it's borrowed off that, that same thing here. So essentially I'm calling the same thing, except I'm calling it with member. Uh, ID and I want to call that uh, with a different relationship because obviously it's not a self role and we'll call that member. And so I'll just bounce that again, and it should pick up the change. And so now, you know, you've got all your members. And, uh, you know, it's, it's not a great deal, but it's, it's all about taking the time away from the developers in, in sort of building up all of these tiny little things that would have normally taken longer. And so, you know, we, we added these relationships really simply and, and with, a, with a pretty easy to learn and easy to understand method. And, you know, I can also add the other way. I can add my, to my member URLs, I can add links back to that as well. Okay, now, the final thing shows a few of the ex new things in, in Spring Boot 1.3. Uh, it also happens to be the demo that's caused the most issues. Um, so in demo 05, we've basically started with the same thing. The only difference is we wanted to deploy it to Docker. Um, who's used Docker and Gradle before? Did you like it? Yeah, you, you liked it. What about the plugin? The, the plugin kind of annoyed me, and I'll, I'll show you why in a second. So, so basically, you know, you just, and this is this is all set out in the, the documentation. So, you basically just pull in the plugin and tell it where your Docker file is, 
copy the jar in. Your Docker file is really simple. Um, Basically, because all, all it has to do is start the thing. So I've added a few things to um, start the debugging service. Uh, Urandom to make it start faster. And renamed it to app.jar because it's, it's shorter. Simple. Now, from there, I type build docker. And it will go away and it will build my, my Docker image. Now, this is where it, it hasn't been as smooth. So, so it goes through and it builds as normal. Uh, This is another reason that I'm not a huge fan of boot to Docker. Uh, so boot to Docker just runs a small VM. Um, and in this case, it doesn't do a great job of it. Ah, and it's, it's run away from my history. So the, 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 the update that it, it made to one of these in it uh, to, to Docker 1.7 seems to have screwed up something. So I just need to grade it, get it to grade a new certification certificate and it should just work. He says, hopefully. Oh, come on. Oh, Jesus. That's not good at all. I just broke it. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, apparently I've killed Docker, so, so we'll skip past this, um, and I'll, I'll just explain what, what, it, what, it, what they've added. So it'll build a Docker image, and you run the Docker image as normal. Um, and one of the awesome things was often, you know, your, your environments you're running, the, the Docker image, or, or, you know, your QA environments seem to be getting further and further away. And so they've added in two really neat features, and it's especially good in Docker, which is remote debugging and remote reload. And so what it does is it will forward the debug port through your web service, and then you can connect to it with a nice little main method and remotely debug it. So basically, you don't have to worry about port forwarding whatever your debug port was. You just kind of have it out of the box. Likewise, all the stuff with live reloading just kind of works because when you change your class as normal, um, instead of your running application picking up the resources have changed, this little application that they bundle with Spring Boot picks it up and sends it across the wire to your VM. So you get everything that you, you got previously when you were running from the system when you're running in a, in a Docker container remotely. Um, so yeah. Uh, I don't think I'll bother trying to resuscitate uh, my Docker install because it's, it's already crashed my computer twice today. So does everyone have any questions? Play around with Jcache? No, I haven't. Uh, so there was playing around with Jcache. So it does have support. And it was something that they've included, I think, in 1.3. Yeah, so they've pulled in a bunch of auto configuration support. And one of the things I really like about when they do that is the code isn't magic. Like, if you go through into the Spring Boot um, GitHub repository, it's actually quite easy to understand exactly what's going on, so you don't have to kind of just rely on it working, like Docker. Environment 
variables, uh, the beans that are in your application context. Um, yeah, you help, yeah, and it's all extendable, so you can actually extend it um, yeah, if you need to. Um, and so yeah, that's pretty cool. I mean, expose it um, on an HTTP endpoint, uh, but you can also expose it through JMS. Yeah, you're right. So. Um, Yeah, so we used it without a web service, and we still use the actuator because yeah, it just comes on up by JMX, and you know if you want to, you can run like an, a little JMX console to look at what's going on. So yeah, it's it's really good, and I think it it even borrows a few things from um, Drop Wizard in terms of the the stats and metrics you can get out of it. Anything else. Uh, which one? That one? Uh, yeah, the HTTP, <coughs> that's yours or? Uh, no, it's basically, it's, it's just something that comes from Spring. So, you know, I can use it here to pass back a 404 if it doesn't find anything from the database. Um, yeah, it's, it's, I think it comes from Spring uh, MVC or somewhere. Yeah, it just comes from Spring Frame. It has some support for several of them. I haven't, I haven't played with message queues yet, no. Yeah, so, sometimes, and I, I did that as well when I was fiddling around with, because I, I needed a bunch of Eclipse Link properties and stuff like that. And in the end, it's, it's a little bit of a pain to have to define stuff like that. But yeah, I just I basically just define the data source yeah, thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, so like I said, I, I came into this not, not being like, pr the last time I used Spring uh, was on a desktop application and ev everything I remember about it was bad. So I remember the XML and I remember some contractor making hundreds of interfaces everywhere. Um, and so that's, that's why I never really touched Spring. And and what I used a lot here was, so they've got, like the starters are what you base your thing off. You see I bring, bring in a few, but the samples will go through sort of actual applications. And they provide quite a few of them here. And it, it gives you a bit of an insight into how, how they would structure things, how they would do things. And those were probably the best resource they have, along with the reference guide. And on spring.io, they've also got a few tutorials as well. Is that all the configuration? All the configuration. 
Yeah, I was, I was looking at that last night. Yeah, so there is a lot of included configuration options like the server.port. And Appendix A of the thing basically lists everything you can, you can put in there.